Welcome to the latest episode of the Ega Rice Burroughs mini podcast. My name is Tim DeForest, and right now we are using the mini podcast episodes to do a journey through the 1912 novel, The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle. We're going to be finishing that up with this episode with a look at chapters 10, uh, chapters 13 through 16. Sorry about that. So if you haven't listened to the previous three episodes, I would suggest you take time to do that before diving into this one, because we are going to get right to it. So let's begin with chapter 13. Doyle, I think, understands how to pace a story. Malone had gone through quite an adventure in chapter 12, but that chapter ended with the pace slowing down a bit. He arranges through Zambo to send a message back to civilization via one of the Indians, and as chapter 13 begins, he goes to sleep in a tree branch over, over the ruined camp. Doyle is giving us a bit of a breather before the action picks up again. And that action does indeed pick up again. In the morning, Roxton arrives at the camp. Without pausing to explain anything, he orders Malone to quickly gather up weapons, ammunition, and food. Then they hightail it to a new hiding place. It's only then that Roxton asks, asks Malone where he's been and explains what happened to the rest of the expedition. And I like this sort of decisive behavior on uh, Lord John Roxton's part and his immediate taking charge of the situation. That's completely in character for him. Anyway, what happened to the rest of the expedition was that they were attacked by ape men. Lord John manages to shoot one of them but he, Challenger, and Summerlee are all captured. The ape men seem fascinated by Challenger, who it turns out is almost the twin brother in appearance to the chief of the ape men. The three captives are dragged through the forest. They end up at the ape man village, which uh, um, Malone and the others refer to as ape town. This consists of primitive huts built into the branches of trees. Roxton and Summerlee are tied up. Challenger, has been carried on the, on the shoulders of the ape men all this time. And now he's being fed and kept uh, and he's keeping company with his, quote, twin, unquote. Here's Roxton's description of this directly from the book. If you'd seen him sitting up in that tree, hobnobbing with his twin brother, and singing in that rolling bass of his, ring out wild bells, cause music of any kind seems to put him in a good humor. You'd have smiled, but we weren't in much of a mood for laughing, as you can guess. They were inclined, within limits, to let him do what he liked, but they drew the line pretty sharply at us. It was a mighty consolation to us, to us all to know that you were running loose and had the archives in your keeping. So there's also some Indian captives, and the expedition learns that the ape men hold one side of the plateau, while the Indians live in the caves at the other half and the two tribes are definitely enemies. Several of the Indian captives are just killed outright, while the others are forced to jump off the edge of the plateau. And we see now how effectively Doyle foreshadowed this back in Chapter 9, when the skeleton impaled on bamboo was found at the base of the plateau. So, in the morning, Roxton, who noticed that the eight men were not built for food, had kicks one in the belly and makes a break for it. He finds Malone at the camp, and that brings us back to the present. Now, I should mention here that except for a couple of incidences at the end of the book, the dinosaurs and the other prehistoric creatures now take a back seat to the Indian eight-man conflict. And as much as I love this novel, I've always wished we got to see a bit more of the dinosaurs. You can never have too many dinosaurs. Of course, since the novel works so well as a near-perfect adventure tale in its totality, that's more a statement of general preference than a legitimate criticism of the novel. And there will indeed be a couple of cool dinosaur bits before we get to the end of the novel. Anyway, Roxton and Malone sneak back to Ape Town. Here's Malone's direct description of what, we, of what they find. In the open and near the edge of the cliff, there had assembled a crowd of some hundred of these shaggy red-haired creatures, many of them of immense size, and all of them horrible to look upon. There was a certain discipline among them, for none of them attempted to break the line which had been formed. In front of their, in front, 
there stood a small group of Indians, little, clean-limbed red fellows whose skins glowed like polished bronze in the strong sunlight. A tall, thin white man was standing beside them, his head bowed, his arms folded, his whole attitude expressive of his horror and dejection. There was no mistaking the angular form of Professor Summerlee. In front and around this de dejected group of prisoners were several ape men who watched them closely and made all escape impossible. Then, right out from all the others and close to the edge of the cliff were two figures so strange and under other circumstances so ludicrous that they absorbed my attention. The one was our comrade, Professor Challenger. The remains of his coat still hung in, stri in strips from his shoulder, but his shirt had been all torn out, and his great beard merged itself in the black tangle which covered his mighty chest. He had lost his hat, and his hair, which had grown long in our wanderings, was flying in wild disorder. A single day seems to have changed him from the highest product of modern civilization to the most desperate savage in South America. Beside him stood his master, the king of the ape men. In all things he was, as Lord John had said, the very image of our professor, save that his coloring was red instead of black. The same short, broad figure, the same heavy shoulders, the same forward hang of, his, of the arms, the same bristling beard merging itself in the, in the hairy chest. Only above the eyebrows, where the sloping forehead and the low curved skull of the ape man were, ape man were in sharp contrast to the broad brow and magnificent cranium of the European, could one see any marked difference. At every other point, the king was an absurd parody of the professor. End quote from the novel. Now, one might think that this would be teaching Challenger a little humility, but as we'll soon see, humility and Professor Challenger don't mix well. The eight men are tossing Indian captives off the plateau. Soon it's Summerlee's turn. Challenger is begging for his friend's life. So, well, perhaps he can show humility of a sorts when he, when he has to. And even in the midst of this immediate danger, it's nice to see the two professors are now friends. Though I suspect that Challenger's innate decency would have had him begging for Summerlee's life, even if the two men still despised each other. Roxton and Malone open fire. Several ape men fall, and the rest are thrown into confusion, running away in panic. This is a short but really well-written bit of action. It ends like this. Challenger's quick brain had grasped the situation. He seized the bewildered Summerlee by the arm, and they both ran towards us. Two of their guards bounded after them and fell to two bullets from Lord John. We ran forward into the open to meet our friends and pressed a loaded rifle into the hands of each. But Summerlee was at the end of his strength. He could hardly totter. Already the eight men were recovering from their panic. They were coming through the brushwood and threatening to cut us off. Challenger and I ran Summerlee, Summerlee along, one at each of his elbows, while Lord John covered our retreat, firing again and again as savage heads snarled at us out of the bushes. For a mile or more, the chattering brutes were at our very heels. Then the pursuit slackened, for they learned our power and would no longer face that unerring rifle. When we had at last reached the camp, we looked back and found ourselves alone. It really is a great action scene. Doyle builds up the tension as we see the captives being thrown to their deaths, then snaps that tension quite expertly when the fighting begins. And I love the way that Challenger thanks his rescuers, giving Doyle a chance to breathe a bit of humor into the situation. Admirable, cried Challenger. Admirable. Not only we as individuals, but European science collectively owe you a debt of gratitude for what you have done. I do not hesitate to say that the disappearance of Professor Summerlee and myself would have left an appreciable gap in modern zoological history. Our young friend here and you have done most excellently well. He beamed at us with the old paternal smile, but European science would have been somewhat amazed could they have seen their chosen child, the hope of the future, with his tangled, unkempt head, his bare chest, and his tattered clothes. He, he had one of the meat tins between his knees and sat with a large piece of cold Australian mutton between his fingers. So, okay, now I'm back to thinking that challenger and humility definitely don't mix. 
If this particular situation doesn't shrink his enormous ego, then nothing ever will. Now, there's some more humor as Challenger refuses to talk about his resemblance to the ape-man king. Roxton remains in charge, organizing things as they decide to immediately travel the 20 miles or so to the Indian caves. Now, in the meantime, they've been joined by several escaped Indian captives as well. Now, Roxton employs the Indians as bearers for the supplies, which can be reasonably seen as the stereotype great white explorer giving the natives the scut work. But in this specific situation, it actually does make sense. The Europeans know how to use the rifles, so using the Indians as supply bearers makes logistical sense. Um, so that's like the issues of race we've talked about in earlier episodes. This one's up to each reader's interpretation. The chapter ends, though, with this priceless exchange between Malone and Challenger. This is Challenger speaking. You keep a diary of these events, and you expect to eventually publish it, Mr. Malone, he said with solemn solemnity. I am only here as a press reporter, I answered. Exactly. You may have heard some rather fatuous remarks of Lord John Roxton's, which seemed to imply there was some, some resemblance. Well, yes, I heard them. I need not say that any publicity given to such an idea, any levity, lev levity in your narrative of what occurred, would be exceedingly offensive to me. I will keep well within the truth. Lord John's observations are frequently exceedingly fanciful, and he is capable of attributing the most absurd reasons to the respect which is always shown by the most undevel undeveloped races to dignity and character. You follow my meeting? Entirely. I leave the matter to your discretion. Then, after a long pause, he added, The king of the ape men was really a creature of great distinction, a most remarkably handsome and intelligent personality. Did it not strike you? A remarkable creature, said I. And the professor, much eased in his mind, settled down to his, to his slumber once more. Now, in chapter 14, the party finds a place to sleep for the night. In the morning, Roxton points out, points out that one of the rescued Indians seems to be a chief, or at least somebody important. He's young, but he carries himself with pride, and he's only addressed by the other Indians with deep respect. Challenger gives an impromptu lecture, theorizing that the Indians are historically recent newcomers to the plateau, perhaps finding their way up to escape famine or pestilence. This, again, is foreshadowing the method through which the expedition will eventually escape from the plateau. Doyle, though, also keeps the pace of the story fast by injecting additional bits of action. One of the Indians is caught and killed by the ape men while going for water. Malone is nearly killed himself, but is saved by Roxton. It becomes apparent that the ape men are still stalking them. Soon, though, they meet a large band of Indians who have come across the central lake in canoes. They meet the elderly chief uh, of the tribe, and they learn that the proud young Indian traveling with the expedition is his son. The chief is leading a war party to look for or avenge his son. So here we get to a portion of the book that is most overtly a product of its time. The Indians are going to attack the ape men. In the expedition, the Europeans elect to join them in battle. Only Summerlee initially objects. And this is more because it's a departure from, departure from the supposed scientific purpose of the expedition rather than on moral grounds. And the plan is to just wipe the ape men out. So everyone is eagerly joining in an act of genocide wiping out what is a sentient species. So, is this simply a picture of imperialism at its worst? In the first part of this podcast, I mentioned an audio dramatization of this novel produced in the 1990s by a group called Alien Voices, with many actors who were Star Trek alum playing the various parts. In that adaptation, the members of the expedition all expressed regret at the necessity of destroying the ape men, but they don't see that the Indians have any choice if they, the Indians, are going to survive. It's, oh, it's either one or the other. And there's no in-between. They then join in the battle and then apparently don't think twice about it afterwards. 
It's an awkward moment in that dramatization because it once again is trying to inject modern sensibilities into the novel and they don't quite pull it off smoothly. But the point made in that dramatization is a legitimate one. The Indians are in a battle for survival with the ape men. That the ape men were there first as hasn't been proven. In any ways, the Indians have been living on the plateau for countless generations themselves by now. So this really is their home as well. There seems to be no way of getting the two tribes to peacefully coexist. So is it either a kill or be killed situation? If so, the expedition was attacking without cause, was, you know, the expedition was attacked without cause by the ape men, and there's no chance of befriending them, so perhaps siding with the Indians was their only option. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to justify this course of action just because I like the novel and I like the characters. I do indeed like the novel, and these are some of my favorite characters in fiction, especially Professor Challenger. But if they're wrong, then they are wrong. But it would be wrong to judge them by modern standards, and the overall situation really can be seen as morally complicated. So, while traveling back towards Ape Town, they once again pass some volcanic vents lined with blue clay. Challenger notices a lighter-than-air gas seeping from the vents. This is sort of a fake-out bit of foreshadowing, since it hints at, possible escape, at a possible escape route from the plateau that actually won't come to fruition. Then we get to the battle with the ape men. It's another great action sequence. It's, it's only a few paragraphs long, but it is intense. The rifles only barely give the Indians enough, enough of an advantage to win, though they themselves do fight bravely, and one of them saves Summerlee's life at one point. Now the battle ends with the Indians victorious, and Doyle at this part point provides two separate moral justifications for the Indians attacking and wiping out the ape men. The first is retribution for the actions the ape men have committed against the Indians. Quoting from the novel, Screaming and howling, the great creatures rushed away in all directions through the brushwood, while our allies yelled in savage delight, following swiftly after their flying enemies. All the feuds of countless generations, all the hatreds and cruelties of their narrow history, all the memories of ill usage and persecution were to be purged that day. The second justification is the inevitableness of man's ascendancy to the top of the food chain. Once again, quoting from the novel, Challenger's eyes were shining with the lust of slaughter. We have been privileged, he cried, strutting, strutting about like a gamecock, to be present at one of the typical decisive battles of history, the battles which have determined the fate of the world. What, my friends, is the conquest of one nation by another? It is meaningless. Each produces the same result. But those fierce fights, when in the dawn of the ages the cave dweller held their own against the tiger folk, or the elephants first found that they had a master, those were the real conquests, the victories that count. By this strange turn of fate, we have seen and helped to decide even such a contest. Now upon this plateau, the future must forever be for men. So whether we as readers accept either of these justifications, both the Indians and the Europeans were indeed products of their time, and this is how the battle was seen through their eyes. Surviving male ape men were thrown from the plateau in retributive vengeance, and the females and young uh, were, were taken into, upon, into bondage. Now in chapter 15, the protagonists accompany the Indians to the cave village. There's another great action sequence as a pair of dinosaurs attack, killing a number of Indians before one is brought down by a barrage of Indian of bullets and uh, poisoned arrows. We then get a, another break from the action. It turns out that the dinosaurs are usually nocturnal. So over the next few weeks, Malone is able to check in regularly with Zambo to see if there's any answer to the message they had sent. He can now travel across the plateau in daylight in relative safety especially with the ape men uh, uh, pretty much no longer a threat. Roxton, in the meantime, builds a bell-like cage out of bamboo. It's a contraption that allows him to walk around while carrying the cage around him, and he uses it to visit the pterodactyl rookery. 
He does this alone, saying he wants to get a chick for Challenger to study, but also hinting that there's another motive. Doyle does a lot of foreshadowing in this novel, and he always does so effectively. Challenger is also making plans as he turns the dried stomach of a dinosaur into a balloon with plans to use the volcanic vent gas to give it lift and provide a means of escape. This was foreshadowed earlier, but its purpose is to keep the action moving and provide some additional humor, as the balloon doesn't work out of the, uh, the way Challenger plans. They, they tie a piece of basalt, basalt to it, and they try a test flight, now, quoting from the novel. Never was our expedition in more imminent danger of complete annihilation. The inflated membrane shot up with a frightful velocity into the air. In an instant, Challenger was pulled off his feet and dragged after it. I had just time to throw my arms around his ascending waist while I, when I myself was whipped into the air. Lord John had me with, with a rat trap grip around the legs, but I felt that he also was coming off the ground. For a moment, I had a vision of four adventurers floating like a string of sausage over the land that they had explored. But happily, there were limits to the strain which the rope would stand. Though none, uh, though none apparently to the lifting powers of that inf this infernal machine. There was a sharp crack, and we were in a heap upon the ground with coils of rope all around us. When we were able to stagger to our feet, we saw far off in the deep blue sky one dark spot where the lump of basalt was speeding on its, upon its way. The Challenger is actually undaunted, and he considers this a successful test flight. But making another balloon uh, provides to be un proves to be unnecessary. The chief's son, who knows they want to escape from the plateau, gives them a piece of tree bark with markings on it that at first seem confusing. It's Roxton who first realizes that it's a map of tunnels leading from the caves to an opening near the surface from which they have enough rope to climb down the rest of the way. Malone gets another chance to contribute when he realizes they've missed a turn as they enter the tunnels, and they do indeed escape. Now, this whole section, the escape from the plateau, it's written with Doyle's usual skill. I think my brief summary might make it sound anticlimactic, but the escape involves several protagonists thinking clearly, under pressure, and their escape does feel like they've earned it. Also, it makes sense that the chief's son would feel grateful to them, and provide them with a, an escape route when he realizes that's what they want. Chapter 16 brings the novel to a satisfying conclusion. And once again, I don't think I'll be able to do justice to it in a brief summary. They return to London and they call a meeting of the zoological, at the zoological hall. Here, they're first greeted with derision when they try to describe their experiences. But that's only until Challenger dramatically brings out a baby pterodactyl recovered from the rookery by Roxton using his makeshift cage. The this, this sight of it causes quite a commotion, and when Challenger throws up his arms to try and calm everyone, he instead panics the poor pterodactyl, which flies off and escapes through a window. It's later seen flying over the coast towards the Atlantic, um, you know, probably following a homing instinct. The poor thing likely died of exhaustion somewhere over the ocean. Two more events tie things up. Malone finally sees Gladys again. You know, remember her? The woman who was determined to marry a true action hero and no one else? The woman who inspired Malone to go on a dangerous adventure? Well, she's pretty much given up on him while he was gone, and she's married a guy named Potts. Malone understandably wants to know a few things, and he asks Potts a few questions. How did you do it? Have you searched for hidden treasure, or discovered a pole, or done time on a pirate, or flown the channel, or what? Where is the glamour of a romance? How did you get it? He stared at me with a hopeless expression upon, a, upon his vacuous, good-natured, scrubby little face. Don't you think this is all a little too personal, he said? Well, just one question, I cried. What are you? What is your profession? I'm a solicitor's clerk, he said. Second man at Johnson and Maravels, 41 Chancery Lane. Good night, said I, and vanished like all disconsolate and brokenhearted heroes into the darkness with grief and rage and laughter, all simmering with me like a boiling pot. Now, I love that bit. I really do. 
I don't take it as a commentary on women in general because, and I don't think Doyle intends it as such, but it feels like something Gladys would do. And sad as it is for poor Malone, it's hilarious. Finally, Roxton gathers the other three protagonists into his room and reveals a fortune in diamonds to them. He had recognized that the blue clay, that blue clay around the volcanic vents on the plateau, he recognized it as being similar to what he had seen in a South African diamond mine. And sure enough, he found diamonds as well as that baby pterodactyl. So all four men can now divide up a fortune. Challenger wants to, to found a private museum. Summerlee will retire from teaching and dedicate his time to classifying fossils. And as for Roxton and Malone, I'll use my own, said Lord John Roxton, in fitting a well-formed expedition and having another look at the dear old plateau. As to you, young fella, you, of course, will spend yours in getting married. Not just yet, I said with a rueful smile. I think, if you will have me, that I would rather go with you. Lord Roxton said nothing, but a brown hand was stretched out to me across the table. That's a great ending, and it ends one of the most purely entertaining adventure stories ever written. Doyle combines excitement, a palpable sense of constant danger, humor, and wonderfully imagined characters into a well-plotted and engrossing novel. I want to take a moment to especially mention the humor. There are, th largely through um, Challenger and Summerlee, a lot of very funny bits in this, but Doyle expertly fits it into the adventure story without ever spoiling the sense of danger that we need to feel. He co expertly combines that humor with the adventure, and it's a very impressive accomplishment. Now, the novel does sometimes reflect the attitudes of the Edwardian era, but intelligent readers should be able to note this without allowing it to spoil the fun. C.S. Lewis once wrote about the importance of reading old books and said that the errors found in such books, quote, being now open and palpable will not endanger us, unquote. Take the lost world for what it is and you'll have a wonderful time with it. So that's it for the lost world. Um, as of recording this on November 16th, 2021, I'm not, I haven't completely decided what novel to cover next in the MIDI podcast. I do want to eventually go back to doing um, in-depth analysis of one of Burroughs' novels, although I will be careful to pick one that we have not done in the full-length episodes. Uh, but right now I'm kind of having fun looking at the other novels that existed um, along with Burroughs or existed just before Burroughs. For instance, I'm seriously considered doing, considering doing um, Treasure Island as the next one, uh, simply because it is an awesome adventure novel and it's worth talking about. And it's the sort of thing that must have influenced Burroughs' own writing. Um, I don't know if there's any evidence he ever read Treasure Island, but it is such an influence on the um, adventure genre in Western civilization that it is worth talking about. But whether I do that or something else, I will be back soon with another episode. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Please, be fe please feel free to visit my blog at Comics, Old Time Radio, and other cool stuff, where you can also find links to my books being sold on Amazon.com. And we will be back with another episode soon.